Okay. Sorry about that, folks, listening over Zoom. Uh, hopefully you can hear now. So in principle, the information in the book is still encoded in all the positions and momentum of the air molecules, all the states of the, the, the ash, all the entanglement between them and so on. In principle, it's still there. And if you could reverse everything in reverse time, the book would reform and the same text would be written in. Okay, attempt three. We're gonna step our game up. We're gonna, no, I, sorry, let me like that. We're gonna take, slide to the nearest, honestly you don't know. Um, and we're gonna throw the book into the black hole. And now Stephen Hawking, Go away. Now Stephen Hawking claimed something very different happened. So he claimed that after you've done this, you wait long enough, the black hole will evaporate, and the information that was in the book will have genuinely vanished from the universe. There will be no record of it yet left. The only leftover, the, the leftover consequence for all its energy will just be some, some photons, some Hawking radiation streaming off in space. But that radiation tells you nothing, even in principle, about what was written in the book. So quantum gravity at a fundamental level is not like all the other theories of physics we know, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, and so on, even general, classical general relativity, it's fundamentally irreversible. So this is the famous black hole information problem. Um, Hawking claiming that information before the two black hole is lost forever in contradiction with the usual rules for, for how things work in quantum mechanics. Pretty much immediately, I think it's fair to say, this made a lot of people very unhappy. Um, John was possibly around at the time. They, they were pretty young. Um, but I saw a fair characterization that people got pretty unhappy pretty immediately. Very unhappy, uh, even the very, it's an accurate characterization. Uh, and it has, has spurred a lot of, lot of debate and so on since. But I think it's also fair to say that over the next 45 years, there have been increasingly compelling arguments that sort of Hawking had to be wrong. Um, the most famous one is ADS-CFT, where we have this explicit duality to a non-gravitational uh, quantum field theory where we know information can't be lost. But what we didn't have until 2019 was a calculation that actually did a ca gravitational calculation using black hole that shows information coming out that says, okay, Hawking did a calculation, but we've got a better calculation, not better calculation, shows information coming out. So that's what changed. Uh, we can now do very precise quantitative calculations, show the information coming back out, show when and how, and exactly you know, the degree to which you can, can find it at any given time. Um, and so that's really, really cool. Uh, but I also want to emphasize, as, as Hiroshi did, that it, it's certainly not the case that all the questions about black holes and information are now done. Uh, these new calculations sort of lead to as many new questions as, as answers um, that possibly will keep us occupied for the next 45 years. I don't know. Hopefully for yet less. Hopefully we keep, keep making progress. Um, but so we can now nail down the missing piece in Stephen Hawking's calculation, what he didn't take into account. Uh, and honestly, I find the answer a weird combination of like incredibly cool and almost embarrassing because it, it really sounds like the, the, the answer a science fiction writer would come up with, which is that you know, the thing he was missing are what's called space-time wormholes. So in sort of Star Trek or whatever sci-fi show you might watch, they often have what are normally called like spatial wormholes or Einstein roads and bridges that are shortcuts connecting two distant points in space. Those are not space-time wormholes. Space-time wormholes are sort of one dimension fewer. Uh, they're shortcuts between two distant points in space-time. There are fundamentally quantum mechanical effects, so like a tunneling effect, uh, but they can connect together different points in space time. It's sort of very reasonable thing that should be included in your calculations. And when you do include them, they show information getting out. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be the aim for the talk. Try and give you some idea of what the original problem was. I'm going to spend half the talk and stuff from the 19, 1970s, uh, and then what the new and, and exciting things are, hopefully, give you a sense of where we're going next. Okay, so let's start with uh, you know, the original work of, of Beckenstein and Hawking in the 1970s on black holes and thermodynamics. So why did that video of the egg merging together and popping up into the air 
look so weird? Why don't in, in real life eggs spontaneously uncreate? Well, it was very important that if we were going to do that, we'd have to exactly reverse the velocity of every single particle in the entire mush of spreading apart egg. Not even all the different macroscopic pieces, but you know, you, you have liquid egg and you really need to get all the, the individual molecules right within that. We just missed a few of them, or even just got the, the specific velocity slightly wrong, the egg won't reform. It'll, it'll smudge back together, but then just collapse in a, in a heap again. You won't, you won't have it reform into a solid object and hop up into the air. So the reason the eggs don't reform, so there's really a very, very large number of possible states for a broken egg. Even a broken egg sort of being smushed back together with some momentum bringing it back together, all of those states are basically macroscopically indistinguishable. Some huge number of things that could really be going on if you see a smush of eggs coming together and, and looking like it might merge. Because the laws of physics are reversible, then if we evolve back in time, then only a tiny, tiny fraction of those states can reform into an unbroken egg because there are just much fewer states for an unbroken egg to be. Okay, there are far fewer microstates for an unbroken egg than a broken egg. So this is, of course, uh, just a, a statement that the thermodynamic entropy always increases. Thermodynamic entropy is just log of the number of microstates, and it's bigger for a broken egg than an unbroken one. And so you, you always go from unbroken to broken rather than the other way around. Famous second law of thermodynamics. So I guess we're really back in the 19th century here, saying that entropy always increases. Okay, now let's let's zoom forward 100 years to the 1970s. People started noticing some facts about black holes. In particular, they noticed that the dynamics of different black holes also appears to be reversed. So that was a quick video of two black holes merging together. It was a simulation from LIGO of two black holes merging. Um, but you never have two black holes unmerging and, and a black hole spontaneously popping out and spiraling out from, from one big black hole. In fact, there's a precise theorem due to Hawking that, that characterizes why this hasn't happened. So that the total area of all the event horizon, all black holes in the universe, never gets smaller over time. And a black hole splitting into two would always have to go to have the sum of the two areas be smaller than the sum of the original one. So it's just not allowed to happen by classical generation. So this looks sort of an awful lot like the second law of thermodynamics, right? Um, we have some quantity that can only monotonically increase, but can never decrease. Of course, you know. Something being monotonic is a, a kind of common thing in mathematics and even in physics. So it'd be very reasonable to say that, sure, but that's just a coincidence, two things that look kind of similar. But there are other laws of thermodynamics. You have, for example, Sirov's law that says there's a notion of equilibrium temperature, then an equilibrium temperature of everything has to be constant. You have the first law, really that's the, the Clausius relation, but it's normally called the first law in the context of black hole thermodynamics. Uh, and you have the third law saying the temperature in, in it's impossible to get something to absolute zero. And for each of those laws, there is an analogous black hole statement where all we do is we replace the entropy with something proportional to the horizon area of the black holes, and we replace temperature with a certain quantity called surface gravity. I say proportional because we can leave all these laws unchanged if we, we rescale kappa to say two kappa and a to a over two. None of them can distinguish exactly what, uh, so what the, the temperature needs to be and what the entropy needs to be. You can get them up to a constant. So this is starting to look like a really pretty big coincidence. Um, and indeed, that's why, why people call it black hole thermodynamics. But no one really knew whether to treat it literally. And there was sort of a very, very good reason why you, you shouldn't. And that's that if you have something with a non-zero temperature, these black holes with a certain surface gravity really had a non-zero temperature, they need to radiate energy. And as a well-known fact, that nothing can escape the black hole. That's, that's the whole point of it being black. So there certainly can't be radiation coming out of it. The black holes can't really have, have non-zero temperature. Of course, that's when Stephen Hawking showed up and made his most famous contribution to physics. What he showed is that when you're adding quantum mechanics, you do get radiation, and you do get radiation, moreover, at a temperature proportional to the surface gravity kappa, just with a factor of h bar at the front. So in the classical limit, then it goes to zero, but including quantum mechanics, it's, it's non-zero. 
and just explicitly to a short sharp black hole of this, this bigger formula here. And I think it's really a mark of, of how big a contribution, how impressive a calculation this was. Uh, just by looking at this formula, you can really see how it brings together some, all these different fields of physics. We have factors of the speed of light in there. So clearly, Hawking was having to do relativistic stuff in this calculation. We have factors of G Newton. So we have, clearly, there's, there's gravity getting involved. Obviously, there's black holes. Uh, we have H bar, quantum mechanics. We have a KB, thermodynamics. And of course, there's facts of pi. So there we go. <laughs> anyway, so he found this formula, he found this temperature. And then, of course, by just matching with the first law of thermodynamics, that lets us to calculate the, the constant proportionality for the area. And setting things to one that are equal to one, uh, that it gives a simple formula the horizon area of the black hole divided by four centimeters constant. This is the famous Bekenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole. It's worth noting, by the way, that now we're including quantum mechanics and the, the Hawking area theorem I talked about before is no longer true, right? If a black hole radiates energy, it gets smaller, its area decreases. So instead what's true is that you include both the area of the black hole and the entropy of its Hawking radiation, then overall entropy always increases. So it's subsumed into the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. So that's giving you a taste of the, the ideas involved, but now let's be a bit more precise about where the Hawking radiation comes from and why Hawking thought it didn't carry any information. So this is famous paper by Stephen Hawking in 1974, where he found Hawking radiation. And there's a beautiful paper by John Page, sort of made a much more precise version of the, the problem than we had before that time. So let's start with entanglement. So quantum mechanics, relatively famously, is weird. Um, and honestly, pretty much any source of weirdness in quantum mechanics, you can trace in one way or another to quantum entanglement. Just the statement that there exist states in quantum mechanics where the state of the entire system is precisely defined, but the states of constituent subsystems are inherently uncertain. They're inherently noisy. There's just no way to define a precise state for the subsystem. Instead, they describe what's called a density matrix, which is a combination of sort of quantum mechanics and, and classical probability theory. So these are called entangled states. The classic example one written here. So it's a, a state on two qubits, two quantum bits, that it's in a superposition of both being zero and both being one. This is a well-defined quantum state. The overall state is not noisy at all, but the states of the individual subsystems, A and B, first and second, are just randomly zero or one. They have, have not in coherent position, they're just in a random state. This is completely different to classical mechanics where you ought just describe the state of the entire system by describing subsystem, first subsystem, and second subsystem, and so on. You describe the position and momentum particle one, then a particle two, and so on. The uncertainty of each of these subsystems be quantified in a very nice way by, by an entropy as any uncertainty is quantified. In this case is called the entanglement. And that entanglement entropy is going to play a very important role in this talk. But it's worth really emphasizing, because we've already seen entropy once, that these two entropies are very, very different. The entropy we saw before was thermodynamic entropy. It's about some very large number of states that look pretty much the same if you don't look too closely. The broken eggs with different particles going in slightly different directions, so they all look roughly the same. But there's an uncertainty from our lack of knowledge about what the specific micro state of the system is. Entanglement entropy is something totally different. It's that no matter how much you know, it's just fundamentally the state of the subsystem is not defined because it's entangled with other systems. Only the global state has, is, is precisely defined. There's some inherent uncertainty from the entanglement. So it's a fact um, that will be useful to us that if the global state is well defined, we split it into two subsystems, then those two subsystems will always have equal impact. It's a, a relatively simple linear algebra type. Okay, so we now got the quantum mechanics. Now we're going to need the black holes. Um, so you may think you know what a black hole looks like, but if you're what you're thinking of is not this, then I'm here to tell you that you're you're not thinking what a black hole looks like. That's what a black hole looks like, at least in physics. Um, so this is a diagram of black hole spacetime. 
where we've done a couple of things to simplify things. The first is we've dropped the angular directions because they have nothing interesting going on um, and generally are unimportant. So the only two things we have are radial spatial direction and time. So R is going outwards, T going upwards. Then we've rescaled the geometry. This is some curved geometry, but we've rescaled it where we don't care about distances and, and distance and time, distance and space at all. All we care about is that light rays travel at 45 degrees to the left or right on this diagram. So out here on these lines, these are in fact infinitely far away. They're infinite radius, R is infinity, far, far away from black hole, very boring, don't care about the material. Up here is what's called the famous black hole singularity. It's, it's sometimes thought of as a point at the center of the black hole, but really it's in the future of the black hole. It's the end of time where, where space and time breaks down. I said here be dragons, um, because apparently in this case, what there is there is a, a dragon from Game of Thrones. Um, don't worry, it's a dragon from one of the good seasons in Game of Thrones. Um, but there's one more important place in this diagram. And that's less crazy than the singularity. We have a lot more control over it than the singularity. Uh, singularity just, just can't say anything about it as far as we know. We need a lot better understanding of, of fundamental quantum gravity to do that. But the last place is the horizon. And this is the last point at which if you go to the speed of light outwards, you can still escape away from the black hole rather than just crashing in to the singularity. Okay, so it's a 45 degree line, light rays travel at 45 degrees. And it turns out that at least for big enough black holes, the sort of classical space time here is, is, is description is pretty trustworthy. This is not too crazy a place. You could actually, for a supermassive black hole, cross the black hole horizon without even noticing anything. You might think you're getting like pulled apart like spaghetti or something. For a big enough black hole, you just really won't. The forces involved are just not that strong. There's no reason to think major quantum gravity effects should be coming into play. So that's what we're going to do to do, do this calculation. We're just going to study the region about the horizon where we think we have control over physics and we're going to find some amazing things. In particular, we're going to look at the sort of fields in our space time near the horizon. They're going to be quantum fields because the universe is quantum mechanical. Um, but we're just going to study quantum fields in, in a classical space time background. We're no, not going to have to worry about the space time itself being inherently quantum. OK, so why do black holes back? Black holes back here. Well, it's a basic fact about quantum fields, about quantum field theory, that if you look at the state of the fields, so you say the electric field, the magnetic field, or whatever it might be, we look at the field just outside the horizon, and we look at the field just inside the horizon, the states of those two fields will be entangled with one another. It's just how, how quantum field theory works. It's always the case. So that has nothing to do with black holes, which is a fact about, about true in flat space as well, true about the fields here and the fields here. Um, but black holes do something very interesting. Because one of these things started just outside the horizon, it's able to escape off to asymptotic infinity. Meanwhile, the one slightly inside the horizon just gets stuck inside. It can, can never make it out because of causality. So what you end up with is fields going up to infinity that are in an inherently noisy state because they're entangled with something very, very far away. And the fact the noisy state they're in is just a, pretty much a thermal state. So this gives us this, this thermal Hawking radiation radiating out of space. We let the black hole sit for longer. The modes that initially started closer and closer to the black hole horizon are able to be pulled apart, have one half go out to infinity, the other half stuck inside of the singularity. So what you find is you get more and more thermal radiation, thermal Hawking radiation going out. All of this is, is entangled with stuff inside. Remember, that's not a problem with information because it's just a subsystem. Subsystems can be noisy, even if the global state is well defined. But this entanglement apparently goes up and up and up and up. This keeps rising. Eventually, what's going to happen? So the entanglement you have, at least according to this description, between this Hawking radiation off far away from the black hole and stuff inside the black hole becomes larger than the Bekenstein Hawking entity of the black hole. This is called the page time, because uh, Don Page was the first to notice its significance. And importantly, at this point in time, the black hole is still very big. Right? When the black hole basically finishes evaporating, the curvatures around the horizon becomes very large. 
classical space time will break down. No one knows what happened. But at this point, the black hole is still roughly half the size it was when it started. Seems like our calculations are still very under control. So is this a problem? Well, I don't know. It uh, seemed like a problem for, for a lot of people for a lot of years. Um, but whether it is or not, it's still a matter of at least a small amount of debate and depends on one very important assumption. And that's sometimes, or it's been recently dubbed, the central dogma of black hole physics. It's that the bekenstein hawking entropy is truly, genuinely, just the thermodynamic entropy of possible microstates of the black hole. Okay, it's really just counting the number of states the black hole can be in. This is known to be true in string theory, certainly true in ads -PFT. I think it's very, very strongly suggested by all the black hole thermodynamics we've, we've, we've seen before, right? If it, uh, you know, if it, if it looks like a pig and it smells like a pig, it's probably a pig. Um, if we accept this, this so-called central dogma, um, then it implies that Hawking's prediction is inconsistent with ordinary quantum mechanics. Remember I said that the entanglement entropy of two complementary subsystems has to be equal if the overall state is well-defined. Well, that would mean that the entanglement entry of the black hole has to be equal to that of the radiation, bigger than bekenstein hawking entropy. But no system can have an entanglement entropy that's larger than its thermodynamic entropy, because that's like saying that um, yeah, the thermodynamic entropy is telling you how much uncertainty there is if you know nothing about the state, right? So, so you know, the most a system can possibly entangle with something is, is so that like inherently you can't say anything about it at all. That's, that's the maximum amount of entanglement can have. The uncertainty from entanglement can't be greater than the uncertainty from just not knowing anything, anything about the state. So what are the options here? Well, there's really two possible resolutions if you believe in the central dogma. The first is just that the, the assumption that the global state was, was well defined and not noisy has to be wrong. In this case, we would have started with a noiseless state, we would have done some evolution, and somehow the, the global state will have become noisy. In that case, we truly have information loss. The other is that the, the assumption that the, the entanglement entropy, the Hawking radiation, just keeps going up and up and up through time has to be wrong. Instead, it has to start decreasing out of before this page time and stay below this curve describing the bekenstein hawking entropy of the black hole. Normally, people assume for, for very good reasons um, that if that happens, it probably turns around right at the last possible moment. And so it sort of hits that curve and then, then starts going down following that curve. Turns out that if the latter is true, and pretty much immediately after the page time, the Hawking radiation can't just look thermal anymore. Instead, it has to start giving us some information about things that have fallen into the black hole. It starts to have to provide, provide information about the, the details of the black hole. Okay, so that is everything. The state of the, the, the black hole information problem around the end of the 20th century. I haven't talked about some very important stuff like ads -CFT, um, but that was the state of the gravitational calculations at any point. Anyway. Um, so now we're going to move on to, to stuff that was done in 2019. Um, there are really two rounds of papers that happened here. Uh, the first, Hiroshi talked about in, in May 2019, I put out a paper, and the same day, total coincidence, not a total coincidence, we coordinate publication, obviously. Um, same day, Almiri Engelhardt Mao from Maxfield put out a paper saying many of the same things. And then six months later, Again, on the same day, I put out a paper with Steve Schenker, Douglas Stanford, and Jambin Yang, and Almiri, Hartman, Maudacinus, Gulian, and Tsukini also put one out the same day. Okay, so what do these, these papers say? Well, there's sort of a loophole in Hawking's calculation. Now, really, what Hawking was calculating were matrix elements of the Hawking radiation density matrix. Remember, that's the, the thing that describes this noisy state of the quantum field. And he's showing that those are uh, thermal and his calculation is under good control, but not like perfect control. So there's always small errors in physics. We always have to make some approximations. But it turns out because this, this Hawking radiation has so much entropy, this density matrix describing it is incredibly, incredibly big. It's actually exponential in the density matrix, of the, in the entropy of the black hole. 
And that means even if there are just tiny, tiny corrections to each of the individual elements in this matrix, then those corrections can completely change the properties of the matrix. In particular, they can change it in principle from a, a maximally noisy matrix to, to one that's like even not noisy at all. Uh, they can have huge effects. So what this means is that you can't use Hawking's calculation to calculate the entanglement entropy and trust it. You can use it to calculate the things he was actually really calculating, uh, which is matrix elements. You can't use it for the entanglement. So we need to do something better. The solution, try and do one calculation that just directly calculates the entanglement entropy rather than doing exponentially many and trying to add them all up and losing control because there are so many tiny corrections. So how do we do that? Well, there's a problem, which is that there's no way to sort of measure entanglement. The a fundamental fact that the product states form a basis, any measurement on one copy of the state can't, can't even on average, distinguish entangled states from, from unentangled states. There's a classical analog of this thing, or even an analog, so it's an interesting type of, um, which is that if I have some fixed state, but I don't know what that fixed state is, that's indistinguishable using a single sample of that state from some sort of noisy distribution where, where each of the things are just completely random, right? I can't tell whether the, my lack of knowledge of what the state's going to be and the randomness, what it appears to me is just from my lack of knowledge of which fixed state is being produced or from the fact that, that the process is inherently random. On the other hand, if I have two samples, I can look and see whether I get the same thing both times, right? If it's some deterministic process, I'll always get both the same. If it's some very, very noisy process, very high probability they'll be different. There's an analog to this in quantum mechanics which is that the trace of what's called the density matrix squared is actually the expectation value of a, an observable and two copies of the system. Rho squared means two copies of rho, two copies of a, a quantum mechanics. If the state is unentangled, then this trace is equal to one, just like the probability of the two states the same as one. If it's highly entangled, it's much, much less. Okay, so we can do some measurements on, on you know, entangled measurements on two copies of the system, and we can determine whether uh, whether it's in a highly noisy state, highly entangled state or not. Okay, so what we're going to do, if we're not going to do this measurement on black holes, that's, that's experimentally, you know, unimaginably hard, but we can do a thought experiment. We can try and calculate what would happen if we did that experiment. So how do we do uh, calculations in quantum gravity? Well, it depends on the calculations. Some calculations we just don't know how to, and we, we just have to give up. But for a lot of calculations, you can do a pretty good control calculation using something called the Simon Park integral. So this is something that appears in ordinary quantum mechanics. What it says is that to calculate, uh, do calculations in quantum mechanics, you integrate over all possible configurations, all possible parts of the particle from point A to point B, subject to certain boundary conditions. For gravity, what are the sort of dynamical variables, the things that need to be integrated over? Well, they're just the geometries of space time. In fact, we can allow even more to be dynamic than this, and, and we should, we can argue pretty well that we should. We can allow the topology of space time itself to be a dynamical thing, and then we have to sum over all possible topologies. Now, I want to say in, in, in four dimensions, you know, this thing is certainly not well defined mathematically. Um, there's some approximation to it, some, some semi classical limit of it should, should make sense. Okay, so if we want to calculate. Trace of rho squared for the Hawking radiation. Turns out there's two important topologies that can contribute. Two, two that both need to be included in our sum and, and can both give competing contributions. The first, remember we have two copies of our, our full system, so we have two black holes. Just to have two copies of a black hole and they have nothing connecting them together, just independent topologies. Turns out this gives us the Hawking answer. It shouldn't be surprising. This is sort of what you get if you, you didn't make gravity quantum, you just had a fixed, fixed space time you did in the calculation. Yeah. This gives the Hawking answer. We find that the, the radiation gets noisier and noisier as the calculation goes on, until trace rho squared gets smaller and smaller. This contribution to trace rho squared gets smaller and smaller. But there's another contribution that shows up, and that comes from a different topology. It comes from two black holes that get connected together by a space-time And as a general rule, 
Gravity doesn't want to have space time wormholes. There's a reason we don't see them every day. They get very, very suppressed contributions from this, this Feynman path integral where we, we integrate overall contributions with appropriate weighting. So this starts out as a very small, tiny, tiny correction. But actually, unlike the one on the left, it doesn't get smaller over time, but instead gets larger over time. The black hole evaporates and, and your wormhole can be smaller and smaller. It's easy to have a small wormhole than a, a giant space time wormhole. So this is getting bigger. This is getting smaller. At some point, there's a crossover. Turns out, well, modulo subtleties. Turns out this happens exactly at the page time. So after the page time, the dominant contribution when you try to calculate the noise doesn't come from, from the Hawking. The way Hawking would have done the calculation, it actually comes from something where the, the, the two copies you needed to calculate the noise are connected together by a space time. OK, so that's great. but. Uh, there's various reasons why trace row squared is not actually a great measure of the noisiness of the state. It's very sensitive to small perturbations and stuff. What we really want is this much nicer quantity of the empty entanglement. Actually, that's going to uh, be a much better behaved thing. And it's going to turn out that it's sort of actually easier to calculate, weirdly enough. So there's a nice formula to the entanglement entropy. It just says it's the derivative of trace row to the n with respect to n evaluated at n equals one. So how do we calculate this thing? Well, what we do is we evaluate trace row to the n for all values of n, and then we're eventually going to find a derivative at n equals one. So it turns out for integer n greater than one, if we're after the page time, this trace of row to the n is going to get dominated by a multi-boundary space-time wormhole, where all the different n copies of the black hole all get connected together by some big like octopus-like thing. Um, and everything gets mushed together in the middle. It turns out this gives the dominant contribution of each time. So that's great, but if we want to take a derivative, we need to know about non-integer values then, right? Integers are pretty useless for, for derivatives on the way. So how do we do that? Well, there's a really, really beautiful and incredibly clever trick. It's come up with in a slightly different context by, by Lukovitz and Maudicina back in 2013. And what they said, essentially applied to this, is that this, N boundary thing has a symmetry. It has a symmetry where you sort of spin that pinwheel around, moving this boundary to this boundary, this boundary to this boundary, and so on. Okay? And we can quotient the geometry by that symmetry and just look at one of these, the shaded in wedge, where we sort of glue this thing directly onto here and don't have the other N minus one copies. So now that sort of looks like just one copy of a black hole. But there's one slightly weird thing about it. Let's imagine if we go in a little circle of radius epsilon around the center point at this sort of end of the wedge, right? Normally, we would have to go a distance of sort of 2 pi epsilon to get all the way around back to where we started with. But because we glued this line to this line, and instead we only have to go a little way around, we have to go 2 pi epsilon over n. Sort of looks like the tip of a cone. So it's called conical singularity. So really, the quotient of this, this multi-boundary space-time wormhole, just an ordinary black hole with a conical singularity sitting there. Strength of that conical singularity, the sort of angle around it is 2 pi over n. We can then just plug in non-integer values of n as much as we like. There's no reason that n has to be an integer anymore. And as we take the limit, n goes to 1, then the conical singularity goes away entirely, right? Because the n equals 1, we just have a single black hole. We don't need to do any quotient here. So for n very close to 1, which is what we need for the derivative, then we have basically the same geometry for, as for n equals 1, just with a tiny, tiny conical singularity. Turns out the entanglement entropy is therefore determined basically just by the, the n equals 1 geometry, which is the original you know, Hawking solution for, for one copy of the black hole, evaporating black hole, plus one extra thing we need to know, which is the location of this conical singularity in the limit, it disappears, then goes to one. So all that matters is the original geometry that we know how to find, plus one special surface. OK? Are you yep. Yep. Yeah, in principle, you'd have to sum over, say, an octopus connecting the other these four, but with these two separate, for example. Yeah, so after the page time, this like fully connected one gives the biggest contribution, this symmetric fully connected one. 
before the page tag, the dominant one will just come from having n disconnected ones with no octopuses at all. Near the page time, there'll be all sorts of things in front of you, and it's a lot more complicated and harder to keep track of. Okay. Great. Thanks for that question. Okay, so all we need to know is where this the special surface, the, the limit of the conical singularity is. It turns out always something called the quantum extremal surface. So don't worry too much about what this is. It's not going to be super important for this talk. But it turns out that the, the sort of Einstein equations, the equation of the motion, tells you that it has to be a sort of local extremum, a local critical point of a particular quantity, which has two terms. The first is area of a Ford D Newton, which is the, the like the Beckinson Hawking entropy, the same sort of thing showing up. And the second is just a, an entropy of bulk fields. Don't worry too much about the details of that. The point is that this is something that we can, in principle and in fact in practice, calculate quite successfully. And then once we've done that, Turns out the answer you get for the entanglement entropy is just given by this quantity. So it's this quantity for, for the special quantum extremal surface. So to find the entanglement entropy, you can forget almost about all this stuff about crazy space time wormholes and multiple black holes and so on. All we have to do is look at an evaporating black hole, find this special surface, and evaluate its area plus this, this bulk entropy correction. In fact, the area will be the more important thing to remember. So this is something we can do. You can find the, the special surface very explicitly. It's, it's, it's there, just slightly inside the horizon of the black hole. So it's pretty much on top of it. In fact, as, as the Hawking radiation escapes, it sort of moves up along the horizon. The horizon is gradually evaporating and getting smaller with time. So after the page time, the entanglement entropy is not given by the naive Hawking answer. Instead, it's given by this, this generalized entropy, this area plus quantum correction of the special surface. The area of this special surface is basically the horizon area. The quantum correction, it turns out, is small. And so roughly, we have that the entanglement entropy is equal to the area of the special surface equal to the beckenstein hawke entropy of the black hole. OK, and as the black hole evaporates, the uh, Surface tracks along the horizon, its area gets smaller, the entropy goes down. We have that second half of the page curve where the uncertainty stops going up and starts coming down again. So we've successfully derived the page curve. Yay, great, this is, this is brilliant. Um, we'd like to do a bit more than that. And in, in fact, we can do at least a bit more. We'd like to sort of see that it's some diagnostic that information is coming out. Uh, the information is sort of sort of escaping because of these ones. Okay, so this is where we get real crazy. Um, so we want to try and get information out of the interior and learn about stuff that fell into the black hole by doing some measurement on the Hawking radiation. Turns out there's a sort of general procedure from quantum computing, something called the PETS map, if, if you're familiar with that, that you can use to extract radiation from some sort of encoded version of the radiation. But in order to do so, Effectively, what your quantum computer is doing is simulating the process of creating a black hole and evaporating it. What happens, you try and do this calculation of making a black hole, evaporating it, manipulating the Hawking radiation using based on your simulation of a black hole in your quantum computer. And what the mathematical calculation says is that after the page time, there is a, a space time wormhole connecting the actual black hole to your simulation of a black hole in your quantum computer. This obviously feels fairly insane, and yeah, it, it is. Um, it's probably the craziest part of the whole story. Uh, there are a lot of questions about how literally you can take this calculation, but you know the, the maths works, and it, it checks out, and it gives all the right answers in very precise ways. Uh, so we need to at least take it seriously enough to, to you know, believe in its answer. Like we're, we're following the rules as we, as we know them. We're getting this answer. We need to, we need to take it seriously. So there's two constraints to be able to do this and get the information out. The first is that we need a black hole to form at all. So before the page time, you just can't make a black hole happen. The dominant contribution to the path integral has, has no wormhole connecting the two things. It just, just doesn't happen. So you can't learn anything. And the second is that you need to actually be able to pull the information through that wormhole so you can then measure it in your quantum computer. 
the information you want doesn't make it through, then you can't do any, any useful measurement. It turns out the condition for that to happen is determined in terms of exactly the same special surface we talked about before. Specifically, the information needs to be further into the black hole than that special surface. If it's inside it, it goes through the wormhole, gets successfully measured. If it's outside, measurement fails. It's not able to pull it through the wormhole. OK, so let's have a look at what happens. Let's say we throw, take some, some little quantum system, maybe, the, maybe my quality, copy of Twilight, maybe just a diary as the usual name, and we throw it into the black hole. We want to know when that information ends up coming out. So before the page time, as I said, there can't be any wormhole. No information is going to come out. We, we, we don't learn anything about what was, was in the book, my secret. What about after the page time? Well, even after the page time, if we've literally just thrown the diary in, it turns out that the sort of world line, the path through space time that the diary takes, will pass outside the special quantum extreme surface. It will be in this blue region here to the right of the QEM. So as I claimed on the previous slide, what that means is even if we make a wormhole successfully, which we can, then this diary won't get pulled through it. And so we can't work out the state of the diary by, by doing a measurement on the whole thing. The information hasn't yet escaped. So that's good, because if it had, then we'd pretty much have the information having escaped before the diary had even like properly fallen in. When the diary was halfway in, the information's already coming out. That would be pretty, pretty paradoxical, and we, we shouldn't want that. So that's very good. But what about if we wait a little bit? Well, what happens, we wait a little bit, and we collect a few more quantum of Hawking radiation. So now we've, we've collected this X-ray radiation up here. That means we, when we compute this special quantum extremal surface, it's moved. As I said before, what happens is it moves up and it moves to the right, it just subtracts sort of along the horizon. We collect more and more radiation. Okay, so now we're going to use that larger amount of Hawking radiation. We use our extra access to more degrees of freedom. And we're going to try and create a wormhole, pull the information out for it, and, and decode it by, by doing measurements on the Hawking radiation. Turns out you only need to wait for a few seconds. The famous time scale called the scrambling time is logarithmic in the entry of the black hole. Logarithms get very small, even, even for pretty big quantities. Um, and then the world line of the diary, same world line we had before. The diary is always the same, same path through space time. But now the quantum extremal surface has moved. And now it will pass the left of the quantum extremal surface, being this green region inside the quantum extremal. This green region has, has a name, a more technical name than the green region, it's called the entanglement wedge of the Hawking radiation. So now, in principle, if we do this very clever manipulation of the, the Hawking radiation with a quantum computer that mathematically at least involves simulating a black hole, then we can pull that diary out through a wormhole, we can do a measurement on it successfully, and we can work out the information within it. So this must have mean that in the sort of true microscopic description of what's happened, the information has already gone out in the Hawking radiation. It's already there, just in some very complicated form. We just have to, to decode it. It's hard work. So this was, was very famously predicted by, by John and by my advisor, Patrick Hayden, back in about 2007. But they made that prediction by not by thinking about gravity directly at all. Instead, they assumed the black hole don't lose information and they looked at what happened to information in sort of strongly coupled chaotic quantum systems, and they made this prediction based on, on, on those dynamics. Um, but really, we're, we're now doing gravity calculation, and we're finding exactly the same answer for how long you have to wait on the nodes. Like the, the linear coefficient in front, we're, we're exactly able to determine it's exactly, exactly what was predicted. Um, so this is, is really quite amazing, at least for me, the fact that this, this works so well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's you know, sort of one of the most precise checks, the quantitative checks we have that this is really telling us sensible things. Okay, so I'm, I'm you know, towards the end of my time, so it's, it's good because I'm close to the end of the talk. But I wanted to say a bit about sort of where we are now, where we go next, what the, the next questions for the future are. Um, and the big one is that to do this calculation where we, we calculate the entanglement entropy, at least as an intermediate step, we had to consider these sort of multiple copies of the same black hole, 
instead of gravitational patterns for computing things for multiple parts. So presumably, in principle, there exists some exact density matrix of radiation. Like, maybe it's too hard to calculate in practice, but if you can compute that exact thing, you should be able to, to um, compute the entanglement entry just by looking at one copy, just by, by calculating all the matrix elements perfectly and then plugging them into a mathematical formula. But if you have only one copy of a black hole, then, then presumably space-time wormholes connecting different black holes don't have anything to do with what happens. There would need to be some other way to do the calculation that never mentions space-time wormholes. So is this possible? It's sort of a, a to some degree an open question right now. Uh, I think that probably the majority of opinion, the opinion I would probably hold most of the time with most of my heart, is that yeah, sure we could. We just don't have good enough control over the calculations right now. But in principle, uh, there should be some way to do the calculation. Maybe it involves string theory. Maybe it involves all sorts of, of crazy physics beyond just effective field theory, quantum gravity. Um, but in principle, the calculation could be done. But there's also a much more radical answer that I don't think anyone would take seriously, except that we sort of know explicitly that it's true in some, some very simple low dimensional time model. And that's the there's just no way to do the calculation. But at a fundamental level, gravity doesn't know what the exact state of the radiation should be. Instead, what gravity is computing for you is an average over different theories, over different theories, each of which preserves information, but each of which will output the information in a different way, each of which will give a different state of the Hawking radiation, but all those states will have the same entropy. So we calculate the expected entropy of the Hawking radiation, we find it follows stage curve, but if we just calculate the expected state, we find it looks totally no noisy as Holton did. So as I say, this, this seems to be how things work in some, some very crude time model, um, but it's very much an open question what happens more risk models. There's actually very good reason to think, at least now, our best models, richest model of quantum gravity, that that can't be what happens, because there isn't just, just isn't a, a good ensemble of theories that could be averaging over it. Uh, too much uniqueness to the theory. Another closely related question that the people are still arguing about is that these calculations very explicitly involve the black hole having a smooth interior uh, and nothing crazy going on there. Um, but people have made various arguments, famously the, the firewall paradox and, and others, that that's just not consistent, that there's, there's no way to, to have the, the black hole interior truly be real. Uh, that that has to be, you know, something has to break down, so it's not there. And I don't think those questions are entirely resolved. Um, it could just be that, you know, like the, the wormhole connecting the, the actual black hole to the simulation, the description of the black hole interior, the smooth interior, is just some, some mathematical trick that lets us do the calculation successfully. But fundamentally, the calculation, things we're really calculating are things like the radiation entropy, which are about stuff outside the black hole. Uh, and so it's, in, it's entirely possible, I think, that like, you know, the, the, these objections still stand up and there can't really be a black hole interior. Certainly, if you want to believe that the, the, the interior is real, and I, I certainly would, I think, you know, pretty strongly, uh, then you have to be willing to accept some pretty radical things and some, some, pretty, some pretty weird stuff that goes beyond the ordinary weirdness of quantum mechanics. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about that now. Um, and of course, the last thing is that the real, real long-term reason why everyone cares so much about black holes, and in particular the interior of black holes, is that uh, we live in a, in a cosmological universe that has horizons, and in many ways is analogous to, to us being right now in the interior of black holes. We, we're not necessarily in the, probably not in the interior of black hole, we, we couldn't know if we were, um, but at the very least, we, we from certain observers viewpoint, we're behind a, a cosmological horizon. And cosmological horizons also have to have entropy, with entropy proportion with the area, but the interpretation there is, is much less clear, it's much less clear how to do anything about quantum cosmology. Um, we're just all very confused about it, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but, you know, the real hope decades down the line is that all this stuff is going to feed back and we're going to get a better understanding of, of how to fundamentally do quantum cosmology. Okay, so let me just end on a couple of brief final comments. Uh, and this is the, you know, let's hype ourselves up. Isn't physics exciting stuff? Um, so 
everything I said in this talk used a conceptual framework, a, a you know, way of doing calculations, namely gravitational path integrals, where we're taking some semi classical approximations. Then. They've really been around since the sort of 1960s and 70s. It's like the obvious way to do quantum gravity if you know how to do quantum field theory and you, you, you know Feynman path integrals and so on. It's just a standard principle of, of effective field theory of having some low energy approximate description. Doesn't have to work perfectly in the UV, but we can we can still do calculations in it that, that don't involve the UV, and applying it to quantum gravity. It's, it's, you know, the whole information problem was that they, the calculation should be doable using just semi-classical gravity, and now we've we've done it using semi-classical gravity, and, and we've got the right answer. But if you look at the actual, not just the story I gave in this talk, which is, is very cleaned up and all the chronology is reversed and so on, look at the actual way. So these ideas came up and, and, and the progress was made. It really came out of stuff in the last five to 10 years uh, that John and Rossi and all sorts of people have been involved in, called the It From Qubit program sometimes, of, of really studying, thinking hard about information from gravity, information ADS CFT, and so on. Um, so that obviously came out of ADS CFT back in the late 90s and 2000s. ADS CFT came out of the sort of dualities and brains revolution of string theory. Like all, all that set of ideas in the mid to early 90s, that came out of just like perturbative string theory and doing calculations there. And of course, you really go all the way back to perturbative string theory. You know, Veneziano, Lenny, people like that were, were, were thinking about nuclear physics and, and you know, nothing to do with gravity at all. Um, there were sort of decades of work you know, on, on seemingly not that related things. that eventually meant that this, this problem that just seemed too hard to, to just tackle directly deriving the page curve, whatever you want to say, suddenly became actually a pretty doable problem if you were, you were thinking about the right, the right technology, the right tools, and so on at the same time. And that's why you have, you have multiple groups of people you know, successfully doing it at the same time. It's just ideas have their time, and they're, they're ready to be found. Um, so yeah, I guess my point in all of that is that quantum gravity is really, really hard. And sometimes it seems like we're just sort of finding new questions to ask because we can't answer the questions we want to ask. Um, but Eventually, we, 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 there were questions that we always wanted to ask and couldn't know the answer to, and we, we are able to answer them. And we are making, I think, genuine progress towards something, not just, just wandering lost in the dark. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for you guys. So just thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for questions, uh, but two comments. One is that uh, if somebody has questions, could you repeat the question yep. so uh, the remote audience can hear? And uh, I have a chat box open, so if there's any remote audience who wants to ask questions, we can just type on chat box and I'll read. Okay, so any questions, please raise your hand. Yes, over there. Um, forgive me if this is too unrelated, but if I like throw a book into a black hole, Yep. Then won't it be inducing super translations on the geometry and creating soft pairs that will also reveal the information? Uh, what's the question? Yeah, so the, the question is about whether whether the soft hairs will encode the state of the book that I threw in. Um, I'm not a world expert on, on super translations. My understanding is that you can certainly have a lot of different states with the same supercharges. So soft hairs are not enough in your uh, on their own to, to answer the problem. My my impression has always been that soft hairs should be be soft hairs should be viewed as the the equivalent of like uh, there are charges in like ADS three CFT two, and that there are a load of extra symmetries you have, but it's it's not like that. Those symmetries determine like the entire spectrum of the theory and everything that's going on. It's just some some additional additional uh, symmetries and stuff that, that constrain things, but they're not enough to, to do everything on those. But I, I'm very much not an, an expert on, on super translations and those sort of charges. So I, you know, I would defer to, I, 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 I have talked to Andy Schrodinger about that and I don't think he would claim that it does, or that at least that we know it does, um, but I would defer to him as much more of an expert on it than me. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, John. When you speak of a black hole interior being just a mathematical convenience and not real, I suppose you're referring to the idea that we can think of the interior or part of the interior as encoded in the Hawking radiation of size black hole. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure I had anything too precise in mind. Um, well, I guess like, the question is, it's a history yeah. Doesn't your calculation seem to provide some persuasive evidence that supporting that point of view? I think it provides persuasive evidence that the the yeah the 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 physical Hawking radiation is an encoding of the the you know the the black hole interior state. I I completely I would strongly say that is true. Whether that means the interior is just a mathematical trick rather than a physical thing that you can jump into and have a conscious experience as you as you fall into the singularity, um, I don't think I would tend to. I think I think mathematical trick is being too dismissive of of the the black hole interior. Um, there, there are horizons all over the place. There are wind horizons and, and things like that. And I think uh, I would need to see some compelling evidence to, to not believe in stuff behind some horizons when we're behind like cosmological horizons, wind horizons, anything like that every day. Um, I think my the default should be that it's real and less, less given very compelling evidence otherwise. And I, I think you know, to the extent that there is evidence, it's evidence that things working out with the interior being pretty real rather than like just the I interior guess, being I guess we'll just have to jump in to find out. I think I think at a certain <laughs> point that's where you have to yeah um yeah any other questions yep please <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't quite know what you're referring to. Sorry, the, the question is um, if we have two physically distant states, distant black holes, why are we neglecting space time wormholes connecting them? Um, I, I don't think we are. I, I possibly made some comment that was interpreted that way that I, I was ignoring, but like actually, Say, say we were trying to, in the distant future, we were trying to experimentally determine whether information gets out of a black hole or not. What, what we would do is exactly that thing, the swap test, the, the replica test or whatever. We would make two black holes as exactly the same as we can, let them both evaporate, and then, then measure a swap operator on them both. And if you do the calculation for that, yeah, it's a bit messier because there's potential interaction between them, but let's just make them be very far apart so we don't have to worry about that. It would be exactly the same calculation as if they're in two different universes. Um, the two different universes is just, you know, makes it makes it nice and perfectly symmetric. And but you know, as long as they're very very distant, much you know, a million billion times the the Schwarzschild radius, then then it should work exactly the same. Okay. Any other question? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, could you repeat the yeah, so the question is about what the what the small errors are in Hawking's calculation if you interpret it as a calculation of, of matrix elements of the Hawking radiation. Um, okay, so so Hawking's calculation is essentially exact up to, to gray body factors and issues like that that we shouldn't worry about um, as a calculation of like QFT and curved space time. Right, but we're not wanting to do a calculation of QFT and scope space time, we're wanting to do a calculation of quantum gravity. So if you want to argue that the two are related, the way you would do that is to say, well, we best way to do quantum gravity would be to do a gravitational path integral. Then we can do a semi-classical saddle point approximation for that. And it's it's pretty, pretty, you know, it's pretty hard to believe that the, the sort of saddle Hawking's thinking about would not be the leading saddle. Um, and then to all orders in perturbation theory, then, then Hawking's calculation would be correct. But there will always be the other saddles, there'll be contributions from brains, strings, you know, whatever else you have in your, your UV complete theory of quantum gravity. So there's always going to be non perturbative corrections to, to any calculation in quantum gravity, unless you really have an exact description of the theory and include, include every possible contribution. Um, so I think the fact that Hawking's calculation is not perfectly exact is. is you know, it's, it's, it's just always going to be true. The, the, the interesting part is that those tiny non perturbative corrections in the individual matrix elements can add up to be, be large corrections for the entanglement. Yes, please. Yeah, so I was just wondering if you could 
Yeah, you. Uh, you mean because of like back reaction and stuff like that? Like if you if you really do a QFT and curve space time, so just in a, a big Schwarzschild background, then yeah, you you're not going to see the black hole losing mass and so on. Um, but I think you could you could do a better version of his calculation that actually finds you know like like like. Just perturbatively update using semi-classical Einstein's equations, um, and you should be able to, like, in principle, find a, a saddle point of the effective field theory with with all the quantum fields integrated out and the the geometry treated class semi-classically uh, to all orders of perturbation theory. I, I you know, this, that's one of those statements that that no one is ever going to do in a million technical difficulties would show up, and you you tried to, but uh, I think in principle it should be possible. Uh, any other questions? So I have one. So, so yeah. you have demonstrated that if you take into account the effects of warm hole, they produce a result that seems to be uh, supporting the idea of central dosing. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, if you allow yourself to take into account the warm hole effect, it also brings in a lot of other puzzling features of uh, quantum gravity, such as long term quantum coherence, etc. Uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, I guess my comment would be that I agree with all those problems. There are a lot of problems out there in quantum gravity. So there's the, the factorization problem from wormholes and, and so on. Um, like there was a reason that a priori you think that you should include space time wormholes, namely it's the, the most obvious interpretation of how the gravitational path English should work. And then there was sort of you know, factorization problems and so on. And people, so people said, okay, maybe we just shouldn't be including those things for some unknown reason. But now they're, they're I would say they're giving us a lot more than they're causing problems. Uh, so at this point, I think you just gotta say, well, they're there and, and you know, they're, they're, there are these issues that we still need to understand. I would say anytime they cause factorization problems, there's no reason to think they're a dominant effect over other non perturbative corrections. And so I don't think there is a control calculation that shows a factorization problem. Um, so another way to see this is that the, the noise in the factorization problem is as big as the factorization problem itself, if you take an ensemble of interpretation. Um, so I think the answer is, you know, we, we, we can do some things in a control way and we can't control some things and the things we can't control, hopefully somehow all work out, but uh, yeah. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't worry too much about something that we don't have control over anyway. Okay. Uh, so, so one thing we can control is to end this colloquium. So thank you so much.